Okay, let's see, I think this is working out for us now. So this is my first time streaming on this kind of a complex level. This is just kind of an experiment, just to kind of see how things work out for us. I'm not using my usual microphone either. I'm using an old beam forming mic that's mounted uh, kind of a forward and ahead of me. So the audio is probably not going to be the best, but uh, I'm hoping it'll work for our needs. So what I have here is I have a 5200, an Atari 5200 that was sent in to receive a UAV upgrade. Uh, unfortunately, due to shipping mishaps, it did not arrive fully intact. Um, as an example, I've got some pretty nasty scratches here on the metal faceplate. I'm not sure if those were pre-existing or not, because I don't know what this console looked like before it was sent. But uh, the rear controller <coughs> storage cover door was definitely broke. Here's parts of it left over here. There's also some plastic I can hear rattling around inside of it, so I'll have to address that once I remove the cover. And the entire front bezel here was also broken, uh, basically in two large sections, but also each of the individual little tabs that snap in along these holes up front were also broken. So even if I were to epoxy the two halves together to at least make the one, uh, it still doesn't have an easy way to secure it to the console. It would basically just be sitting there. I mean, I suppose you could apply a little bit of epoxy underneath it and just kind of set it down and just kind of hold it there. Sure, that would work. Um, and I might even do that. I don't, I don't know. But uh, I usually prefer not to try to restore the, the consoles if they arrive to me uh, broken because that's, that's really not... Um, part of what I do and um, it's not uh, yeah there's just a lot of extra labor and and what I put together or what I try to restore may not be to the client's satisfaction and so in those instances I usually find it best to just you know have to report the issue and just say hey sorry it happened um, I you know and then I will work with them to try to find either a replacement case shell for a reasonable price or um, send them links to perhaps eBay, Macari, whatever, to uh, to find something. But anyway, what we need to focus on first is to make sure this unit does work uh, properly. And then uh, from there, uh, I will proceed with at least the UAV board installation. I can still do a complete UAV install even with the broken plastic because only the bottom case shell needs to be intact, which is fine for that. So we're good there. Uh, it's really just the uppercase shell that's been affected by the uh, shipping damage. So uh, what I need to do first is to get some power on this and uh, to test it out and make sure that it's at least somewhat functional. I am going to go ahead and remove the top cover on it first before I do that because I don't really need that. And like I said, I could hear some plastic rattling around inside of it earlier. All right, so let's get this thing opened up. Also, I'm not sure how long I'll be able to stream for. We have some uh, reports of very inclement weather on the way to this part of the region. So if the uh, ivory tower should befall or come under attack from the nothing, I will have to abruptly end my stream and join in the defense measures. So what I'm doing right now here is just removing the seven screws that are holding the top case or the top shell to the bottom. Five of the screws are the same length with the two screws that hold the upper section near the controller storage being much shorter. In fact, they're only about half, half as wide. Not sure if I can get that to show up on camera, but, uh, so it is something to be aware of. I have had 5200s that obviously have been worked on before by somebody, and I will see holes punched in through the top of the case shell from where a screw that was too long was used. All right, let's carefully turn this back around again. Like that. And uh, get this top cover removed. Let's see how much plastic I got floating around inside of it. Let's see, what's the inside look like? 
A few little dust bunnies, nothing to really speak of. I don't see any uh, spider nests in here, which I sometimes will find. For those that aren't aware, next to the nothing, spiders are the ITC's next greatest fear. Oh, this is interesting. Um, I may not be the first person inside this. And the reason why I say that, it's going to be kind of hard to show this. Uh, let me get something to point with here. So in looking at this, the actual tabs for the RF shield have been folded down flat. They're not twisted, which is the normal method that Atari used. Additionally, you'll see that we've got these uh, what look like fingerprint marks that have actually tarnished the RF shielding. That's pretty normal. That'll, that's what will happen when you don't have gloves on or something. But yeah. Aside from that, it's got the usual kind of dusty inside. No big deal. It's a pretty standard, typical two-port unit. There's a, another piece of the plastic here that's left. Uh, so I'll be sure to include that when I send it back in. Let's see. It's not wanting to lift up just yet, so I'm going to need to get me a screwdriver. Gently lift up like this. To get out those front pegs. Oh, those are pain. It does not want to come loose from this one at all. There we go. I got it. Just got to be careful with them. It's not unusual for the little pegs to actually break off in the process. That's it's not the end of the world, but it is uh, pretty common. <laughs> okay, well, aside from some extra dust, I really don't see any extra plastic, but hey, look what I did find. I found an overlay for Pac Man. <laughs> That's. That's pretty funny. I have uh, I've worked on quite a few 5200s. This is the first time I've found an overlay inside of a uh, inside of one of the consoles before. How did it get in there? Did it fall in? No, it couldn't have gotten in through the cartridge port because that's fairly sealed. It's not wide enough for something like an overlay to fit in there. Somebody would have had to have curled this up and slid it through one of the openings through the RF section. That's the only way, but it doesn't look like it's been folded or curled up in any way to do that. How did that get there? You think it could have fallen in from the factory? Or, I've already stated, it looks like somebody's been in here before. It's possible they dropped it in there and didn't realize it before reassembling the console. That's the most likely explanation. Anyway, we found an overlay. I'll be sure to uh, put this with the rest of the uh, parts so my client can get that back. Yeah, and here's what's left of one of the uh, hinges. I'm surprised that the pegs actually stayed intact and it broke the main plastic, but there is a pretty nasty crack right along here, which you can see better from this side. And uh, it's just, it, it wiggles, it's just barely attached. So let's put this away. Now, another thing I'm going to do here is to get the length and distance of the RF cord basically where it was before. Um, I'm going to, although this one's a really thin cord, so it's not as critical here. The original RF cords for the four ports were much thicker, but I basically am going to mark with my silver Sharpie um, roughly where, where it needs to be. So that uh, when I go to put it back together, I know that I have the length in it, the length set properly. And what I'm going to do is, now I know I haven't tested this yet, but I am going to go ahead and pull this loose from the shell. Because I really only just need the main board and this RF cable. I don't need the rest of the plastic. So I can get this out of the way. And we'll get that cleaned up for later. Okay. Put the RF cable back in. Oh, I need a power supply. It's my perfect opportunity to test my new power supply that I recently purchased from Console 5. Let's see here. Make sure this is the right one. 
Yep, center tip positive, 9 volt, 1.3 amps. I think the amperage might be a little low, but this is what they sell and offer, so we'll check it out and test it, huh? Let's see here. It's not a very long cord either. That's all right. Get it plugged in. Yeah, I got, uh, I mean, I do have a normal standard 5200 power supply, but uh, as they're quite large and bulky, I thought it would be nice to uh, get something a little more small and manageable for the bench. You can see the bench is, well, it's crowded. So let's get a cartridge put in. Uh, since I took the cover off, <laughs> I'm going to need a way to defeat the dust cover. So for those that have ever seen me do this before or haven't, I actually take a Q-tip and I'll basically cut, I'll cut it in half about like that. And what I'll do is I'll take the part I just cut and I'll actually insert it into the dust door like that. And that's enough for the door to open without needing the pegs. So I can insert it just like that. And the Q-tip head is uh, small enough to actually be able to fit between the space without like getting jammed up inside the cartridge or something. But if for some reason it did get messed up and it did get jammed up inside the cartridge, I'm more than happy to take my Atari Max apart to fix that. All right, let's get a controller ready. Let's get my LCD turned on here. Get this Capton tape out of the way. This is very much a test controller. It doesn't even have the top bezel on it, and I'm always having to push this down. But it works, and that's what's important. All right, moment of truth. Okay, that took some doing to get turned on. Okay, noisy sucker. Uh, yeah, I can see that the audio coil has been uh, shifted over, shall we say. go. Let's see if I can adjust that a little bit. That's still buzzy and loud. Interesting. I wonder if it's this power supply, because it is a switching power supply, so it could be introducing noise. All right, this being a two-port model, I'm going to need to use my 2.3 test ROM. Okie doke. I need to press start, which means I need a way to actuate my buttons. All right, do a quick CPU test. No issues there. Didn't expect to see any. RAM test. Five. Always skips chip number six. I've never figured out why. Okay, RAM test good. I'm not even going to worry about the ROM test. Uh, Pokey adjust. I'll get to that in a second. Let's try the GTIA. <clears throat> that looks normal. Okay. No errors to be had there. Let's check out the Antic. And that looks normal as well. Ooh, colors are off though. Or at least they're off on here. I don't think I'll try to adjust them until I get the UAV put into place. You're not gonna be able to tell too much on the video from your angle, but basically this line here and this line here should be the same color and they are not. This is clearly darker more of an olive, almost a light tan, compared to this green. And there's virtually no separation between these two greens here, which I should be able to see. Now, granted, this is on RF. It's not going to be the best picture anyway, but I should still be able to at least see that. And these are nowhere near close to matching. So uh, 
more than likely the color wheel will need some slight tweaking. But until I get the UAV installed and can actually check it on my little CRT PVM right here, um, I'm not going to mess with the color adjustment. I don't use LCDs for color adjustments because they, they produce the colors differently anyway compared to how a CRT did. And it's just not very reliable. Okay, so that takes us to the pokey. All right, number four. And there are my current values. Actually, my controller is not too bad. It seems to be right where it needs to be. Uh, let's see. I didn't want to do that yet. Let's go back to adjustment. Go. So what I'm going to do here is I want to verify that the console itself is calibrated properly for the pokey chip. And I need to get my tester for that. Tester, you say? Well, yes, I have a loopback board specifically for this. Now, because these bad boys are prone to ESD, before I plug this in, I'm going to get my wrist strap put on here. It's a bad idea to plug controllers in when the system's hot anyway, but especially so like this. So just gonna, let's see, where's a good, could just attach it right off the cartridge port here. So it should be attached to ground. Good way to check that is just to use a multimeter, put it in continuity. I'll just touch the shielding and the RF box. There we go. So I know that the RF shielding is definitely tied to ground. Well, that's interesting. Uh, what just happened there? Well, that was unusual. I don't know if you guys caught that or not, but the screen just went Caddy wampus on me. Let's. And 4013 is a little flaky. Oh, that doesn't look right at all. Nope. We've got something weird going on with the video here. It looks like this may have just bolted on us. Cool. Is this going to turn into a nice little troubleshooting session now? Right, let's use a dedicated test cartridge, or a Pete's test cartridge, just to at least see if it produces anything different. Okay, well, I got a title screen. Green. Okay, well, Pete seems to have. Seems to be loading up. Ooh. That was weird. Yeah, we got something goofy going on with the uh, with the video there. Very strange. All right, well, I can use Pete's to test the, the controller ports as well. The only problem with it is, is that Pete's test cartridge goes all crazy when I plug in the test board. So really, to use Pete's test cartridge, I have to take the controller apart and make absolutely sure I have the potentiometers perfectly centered. So 
Makes me wonder if I was uh, correct about that power supply not quite having enough current to do the job. Yeah, the Atari Max does not look normal at all. Let's try a legitimate 5200 power supply. And if that actually corrects the issue, then I need to send a little email off to uh, Console 5 to say, hey, your uh, your 5200 adapter is not <clears throat> quite up to snuff. It'll work okay for standard cartridges, but it doesn't look like it's going to work too well for flash cartridges. But hopefully it's not necessarily the power, and it has more to do with something up with the console. But we're going to find out. Okay, now we have an actual 5200 power supply plugged in. I know the supply works because this is what I was using oh, just as recently as a week ago, not even that. Now we're going to put the Atari Max SD straight in and see what we get. Okay, let's see if this makes a difference. I'll power it right up. Nope, that does not look good. Interesting. All right, to err on the side of safety, let's make sure my cartridge is clean. So let's see, I'm gonna get a fresh Q-tip. There, Frog7609. Not sure when you sent that message, but I just saw it. Uh, if you're still watching, I've actually installed quite a few UAV boards into 5200s. It's that part I'm not worried about. It's always, you know, the troubleshooting aspects of testing the console, making sure it's good to go. I'm really hoping there's not a problem with my Atari Max. I use it all the time. But if I remember correctly, I believe all the um, Atari Max cartridges and the ColecoVision one have lifetime warranties on them. So, yeah, well, cartridge is clean. I mean, there's uh, very little on there, pretty much nothing. So, we'll try this again. If this actually works, then it means it's not necessarily the cartridge, but it could be the cartridge ports. Gave me a black screen. I think it's my SD card. But we'll take it out and see if that makes a difference. Okay, I am getting the error that it cannot read the SD card. Check that the SD card is fully inserted and that the card is formatted. So maybe there's a problem with this SD card. Looks all right. Well, now I have a picture again. 
and it's still just as loud. So I guess it wasn't the power supply to blame for the buzzing audio. So uh, that's good. All right, let's go back to where I was trying to get to before. All right, and I was at number four for the pokey adjust. All right. Again, my controller by itself is actually reading. Ooh. It just went south on me again. Okay, so. Well, that's not the problem. But somehow, when I went to unplug this, it did not like. Okay, see, I got some graphic corruption going on here. This is, wow. I don't think it's the cartridge. Could be the SD card. Oh, I really need to get the, I really need to get the actual pan tests on physical cartridges besides Pete's test cartridge so that I don't have to deal with the Atari Max or trying to use the Atari Max to switch between them because that's obviously not correct. Let's try to execute seven. Yeah, test seven's not working. Uh, interesting, very interesting. Let's see. Back to a blank screen. Still has trouble powering on and off. I wonder if it's the power switch. Not sure on that. Pete's test cartridge is working okay. Except I just don't have a good way to check the values using Pete's test cartridge on the pokey, but. Pizza's coming up okay. Definitely something else wonky with this thing. I may just have to remove the RF shield and take a peek. Values are close enough for now. So first we need to figure out what's going on with the stability of the system. So it's functional enough for me to go ahead and take the RF shielding off of it and at least see what's going on there. Like I said, I can tell I'm not the first person inside of it. So, always fun. Right, let's go ahead and unplug it. Better attach myself to some ground real briefly there. Okay, so let's get the uh, RF shield off this thing. Also be sure to check the pins solder points under the controller ports. All right, let's go ahead and let's see, where's the tool I need for this? It's not really that one, this is the one I need. Like I said, this is not how Atari originally assembled the RF shields. I'm not saying Atari didn't do this, but it would be pretty unusual. They always twisted them. Uh, they always twisted them clockwise. Which is why in most of my instructional videos, I'm always saying, hey, we need to uh, turn this counterclockwise to untwist it. Okay. 
I like using this tool. I think it's actually designed for twisting wires. Or at least that's kind of what I've been told. But I actually just use it for what you see here. And that is for lifting the, uh, getting these tabs lifted up on the RF shield. Because it does a really good job at that. Okay. Got these others along the sides. Flip this around. My microphone's still working okay? Yeah, looks like it. I do have my better quality microphone. It's Bluetooth, but it actually plugs directly into the camcorder that I use for all of my uh, filming. And it's battery powered, and it would not last <laughs> long enough for me to work on this console. So that's why I'm trying this other one instead. Let's go ahead and temporarily disconnect myself here. Let's get this RF shielding off of here. Easily one of the least favorite things about working on the 5200 is the RF shield. This one's actually coming off pretty easily. There's the bottom. Set that off to the side. Now we can get this top one off of here and see what we have underneath. Well, it looks like a pretty standard 5200 to me. Don't see any work. Looking like it's ever been performed on it. Make sure everything is seated well. GTIA is in. By the way, this pen that's been lifted up on the GTIA is completely normal, at least on the two port unit. That's, a, that's an Atari factory done thing. That's what that is. Okay. Well, I don't see anything obvious on the top that looks like it's ever been serviced. Let's take a look at the bottom of the board. Okay, so we have quite a bit of flux residue left over on the GTIA and the 4013. I think that's the 4013. No, that's not the 4013. That's actually the... Uh, that's the control, or that's the uh, buffer, I think, for the BIOS. And then, yes, there's this big ba uh, bodge wire here. This is also factory done from Atari. Nothing unusual about that at all. Ooh, okay, now, this is interesting, though. We have a lot of corrosion around the Player One controller port. Let's see if that will clean up at all. This is initially just alcohol that I'm using to clean that up. It looks like water spots or old water. And since I'm thinking about it and I got this out, let's try getting some of this flux off of the chips here.
It's one of those situations where it's like, uh-oh, I made a clean spot. Now i got to finish up the rest. Now we'll take a, another look at this controller port. Actually, it looks okay. Yeah, it does actually. It looks pretty good to me. Thing looks loose. Doesn't look as clean as the other one does, but uh, in fact, it may have been. I think that controller port has been replaced in the past. That's what I think. Uh, seems like maybe there's some fresh solder work here on one of the RAM chips, but that doesn't make sense because those are all in sockets. You wouldn't need to, unless they suspected the socket was bad. Which I suppose that's possible. The graphic glitches we're getting actually look like they could be from the Antic, not the GTIA, but I do see a lot of solder or flux here on the old GTIA section. Let's try cleaning that up a little bit. See if anything looks suspect there. Do, 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 do. Okay. No, not really. Okay, well, <clears throat> what I will do is I will try running this again real quick just to see if we still have some goofiness that occurs now. Let me get myself attached in here to some ground. <laughs> I don't want that to pop out, so let's brace that up a little bit with something. Okay, let's try the Atari Max cartridge again. Actually, the uh, pens on the cartridge port look really good, actually. I mean, there's some dust in there, but I mean, they're not, uh, I don't see any obvious corrosion. They're better shape than most. Let's pop in some power. There go. Let's get the RF reconnected. Actually, I don't need to do that. I don't need to use this RF at all anymore because I have my own higher quality RF cable that I actually clipped the end of it off of it so it would fit into these low profile RCA jacks. All right, well, let's get a controller back on there. Okay, seems to have fired up okay. Oh, and as soon as I move a controller, it goes caddy office. Interesting. And now nothing. Wow. So either there's something up with my Atari Max cartridge, or there's something up with this 5200. Again, Pete's test cartridge seemed to work okay. I believe if there's a problem, Pete's test cartridge will detect that. Um, during its boot sequence. Well, that's not right. We might have something. Like that. There's something definitely uh, not happy with this 5200. Yeah. Now we're not. <coughs> excuse me. Now we're not getting really anything at all. Let's make sure it's not a connector issue. Still a black screen. Okay, so now it has turned into a troubleshooting session. This will be good. 
All right, so first thing I want to do is check some voltages. So let's get my meter out. Switch over to DC. And do, 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 do. let's get the clip on it. Let's get it attached to a good solid ground. I have to get that out of there. I expect a black screen and nothing. That can't be right. I'm not reading much of anything here. Interesting. Okay, so because I don't have a cartridge in it, let's go ahead and plug the cartridge in. Even if it's not coming up correctly with a cartridge in it, let's get a cartridge in it. Still getting the black screen. I'm not really getting any voltages here. Oh, there we go. Uh, okay, so we're getting about 12 volts. That's fluctuating quite a bit. What on earth? That voltage regulator looks like it might be dead. There we're getting, it looks like we're getting about a steady 12 volts. I'm getting anything from this one though. Interesting. We may have bad voltage regulator. Okay, there we go. Now I'm getting some voltage. I just wasn't getting. Just killed itself. And now it's not powering off. That's weird. <laughs> Interesting. It is staying powerful. Maybe a problem with the 4013. Let's see if it still stays powered on. Just in case this is causing an issue, we'll disconnect the meter. Nope. Instantly powers on. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so what I'm going to be doing is a couple of things. Uh, first thing I will do will be to desolder the switch and clean it out. I have seen those get corroded inside and just get goofy. Get the desoldering iron ready to go for that. And I may have to possibly replace 4013, and these do fail. These these do fail, but not usually like this. 
definitely got some warmth on the, at least on this plate. I didn't get a chance to check this one out. Let's see. Looks okay. Well, <clears throat> that's what we're going to do first. We'll take the switch apart and go from there. Okay, we're also going to need to apply some fresh solder to the switch. Which is right here. It's actually three points on the switch. There's like a, a common ground between the two sides and then we have the actual switching on off which is directly connected to the uh, 4013 uh, and then I think the others could just be anchors. can't remember right offhand. Is my iron already ready to go? Yes it is. The switch used on the 5200 is kind of weird, but uh, sure this is clean. A little bit real quick. Yeah, but I got a glob of solder I need to get out of there. That's from the last time I worked on it. Or was using it. There we go. <laughs> I think it's undone enough. There we go, it's sticky. That's not unusual. old flux and stuff gets underneath them when they were installed at the factory. Yeah. Okay, so there's the switch easily removed. <clears throat> Let's clean that up a bit. Taking the switch apart is not too difficult. You do got to be careful because the plastic can break.
Okay. It's really not much to these switches. It's just a couple of little metal contact points inside. Basically, it's a dome switch. It shows some discoloration on it though. Now it's kind of fighting me getting out of here because this is actually attached to the uh, pens or the leads that we soldered down to the board. Yeah. I'm going to have to clean this up a little bit. Hook it back through there. It's one side being kind of a punk. Just trying to finagle it out of there. You could also straighten these up because they're actually bent at a slight angle when they're initially in there. But this came out. Neat. That's okay. So it does not want to come free. Okay. Yeah, it's a little corroded in there. Okay, so what I will do is spray a little bit of my contact cleaner in here. Doesn't shoot me in the face first. It has a tendency to do. Good thing I'm wearing my goggles or my magnifiers, touch my eyeballs. It's hard to get an exact spray with this stuff, but okay. I know what I can do. Let's uh work.
Then I will spray these with a little bit of alcohol. I like it when they squeak. It's a good sign. Okay. We just gotta assemble it back together. The other thing I'm going to do here in just a second is I will put some dielectric grease inside to help with future wear and um, also to help minimize future corrosion. Okay. That's what this will be for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, these are already pretty worn. So I'm gonna use the ends of one of these. Just kind of get it smeared around in there. It has a tendency to sort of liquefy a little bit as it sits there and kind of just uh, works itself where it needs to go. Okay, throw that out. So yeah, it's just some silicone compound dielectric grease. Its purpose is to, uh, we'll get there, hey man, just wondering, where do you get your TMS RGB boards these days? Do you make, build them yourself or order them from that guy from Ireland? Yes. I get them from Video Game Perfection, or at least that's where I got my last set of boards from. Um, I've already installed at least one of those, and uh, as far as I know, it's working okay. Um, it was recently discovered that through the Tink 5X, that the TMS RGB boards apparently are pretty noisy. Um, they're fine on an OSSC, and, and I think it looks better through a Tink 2X versus the 5X, but yes... There is some noise on the TMS RGB boards. It was not exactly expected at first. Okay. A little bit of dust around the edge of this. I'll just use my Q-tip here to just kind of wipe that off. It won't sound as clicky anymore because it's got the dielectric grease in there, but it should work fine. Um, one last thing I'm going to do is I noticed that there is a little bit of... Lux residue, of course, still on the bottom of this, so I'm going to hit it with some alcohol spray real quick. Use my toothbrush to kind of get in here a little bit. Some of that will seep inside a little bit, but it won't cause any issues to really speak of. Should be fine. Go. So, yes. To answer your question there, Frog7609, I do get them from the guy in Ireland at Video Game Perfection, or at least 
Again, that's where I got my last set of boards. For a while, uh, Ruggers Customs was going to be offering those boards. And then for some reason, they chose not to. So that's kind of unfortunate, but uh, you know, it's a decision they want to make. So there we go. I don't know what the circumstances were behind that, but yeah, they're not going to offer them. So to the best of my knowledge, Video Game Perfection is the only site to get a hold of them. So, you know, I would advise ordering more than a few just to make it worth the shipping. I should be using my fume extractor for this, but it's also very noisy when I use it. Although I did test, and OSB is able to filter it out pretty good, but then whenever I talk, you can hear it, and it's pretty noisy at that point. Okay, so will that make a difference? I don't know. Um, again, the issues that I was seeing look to be something at a logic chip level or possibly um, with voltage. Let's try cleaning some crud off of here a little bit. This voltage regulator was at least putting out five volts once I got a lead on it to really test it. Get the fuzz by these off of these. Voltage regulator section seems to be just a dust magnet. Okay. Oh, there is some. Let's see what that, what that might be. Just some dust. Well, just to be on the safe side, I could go ahead and clean the cartridge board out. Since I have a little bit of this stuff still left, let's just go ahead and. Pour that right into the cartridge port. Might still hit it up with a little spray. Okay. It's a shame there's no US distributor. I heard about Ruggers. Wish he would have offered them, but hey, what can you do? Yeah, I don't know what the circumstances were. I know that Jimmy was planning to offer them. So I don't know what changed his mind or what transpired otherwise. I know that when we found out, when he found out, especially because he investigated it more than I did, um, I reported it because I had a client complain about, and I saw it for myself, um, just a goofy noise coming across on the RGB through the Tink 5X. I know that he was pretty dismayed when he found that out, um, Ruggers, and decided that uh, he might not... He was basically telling me he wasn't going to recommend the TMS RGB board to anyone with a Tink 5X. Um, I don't know that the issue was that bad, honestly. The only problem I have with it that was reported to me that I saw firsthand is that for some unknown reason, the audio from the ColecoVision is very, very low, and this is exasperated through the 5X. I actually had a 5X that one of my clients sent to me for about two weeks of testing and tried all kinds of things to try to fix low volume issues with the ColecoVision and was not really successful. I was able to at least get the SGM to be properly in balance with the rest of the code. Yeah, that's actually a pretty dirty cartridge slot. 
I'm not saying that's the problem here. I don't really think that is the issue, but it doesn't help. Let's get a cleaner section of my t-shirt here. Just about there. I think we're ready to hit this with some alcohol now. Uh, it is a shame there isn't a US distributor for the TMS RGB boards, but I'll be honest, I've only had, I don't know, I think I've only had to install four of those for clients, and that's because Ruggers usually gets most of that business. I would send a lot of people his way because he specializes really in the ColecoVision, whereas um, I tend to specialize these days more on the Intellivision and uh, the Atari systems. So a majority of my business has been largely Atari and Intellivision, especially lately with the new RGB options for the Intellivision. I've really gotten, I was getting quite a bit of business on that. Unfortunately, I'm out of the cheaper RGB boards that I was using. And as a result, I can now only currently offer the more expensive board from Crayon King, which works fine. There's nothing wrong with it. I'm just not a fan of the palette choices he has. And I don't like the fact that you basically, if you're going to use a Genesis Type 2 cable with it, a Genesis 2 RGB cable, you're going to have to live with a slightly darker image. Um, and that's because of the resistors he's got added within the circuitry. But he didn't design them to be removed like a lot of other RGB boards do. So you have to have them. You remove the, the output resistors, you get nothing. The video image is simply way too dark. It just doesn't work. It's not attenuated at all at that point. So pluses and minuses. But I did get news not long ago that Yannick's new version 2 boards are done and tested. And soon, hopefully, uh, we'll be able to get our hands on some of those again. All of 5X malarkey makes me glad to be just using the RGB to comp into a CRT. No problems there. Yeah, uh, I'll be honest. Um, I actually, I mean, I don't use a CRT at all anymore other than just my little PBM here for um, like a separate color calibration and it does do composite nest video. I actually use this for the composite nest video testing and not the LCD. This LCD actually does really good uh, RF, much better than like any other TV in the house. It's a cheapy little Insignia 19 inch I've had for years. In fact, I never even removed the plastic, <laughs> the protective plastic around the bezel. Um, but it has an issue. I, I don't know if it shows up or not. I've shown it in other videos. There's a section a bad, uh, there's a segment of bad lines in the LCD panel. In fact, I can actually see it without it even turned on. That's how nasty it is. In fact, I'm just kind of holding my hand here, just reflecting it, and I can actually see that line that does not work uh, through the reflection of my hand. That's crazy. All right. <clears throat> I'll clean the cartridge port a little bit. Let's see if it just immediately powers back on again. And it did. So, uh, that now places blame on the 4013. I have replacements. It is a known failure component, so I tend to have a few of those on hand. Uh, get my 5200 box. So I'm going to need one of those too. That's a UAV kit. It's a kit form for 5200s. Um, there's a 4052 muxes, there's four port BIOS, 4050s, ah, there's my bag of 4013s. So we will take one of these out and check it out. But yeah, back to the 5X. I was not that impressed with the 5X. I really wasn't. Um, first of all, it, it is an expensive device. At $300, it's, it's not cheap, that's for sure. Um, this is a used one, but it must be good, or I wouldn't have put it in here. Um, yeah, I was not that impressed with it. Uh, now, I know there's been firmware updates since I had it for testing, and I'm sure some things have been improved, but some of the output resolutions were really weird on it as far as how they uh, looked and responded compared to... 
what I have seen and uh, compared to like the 2X. I actually have a 2X SCART and I use it right here in the bench area and it works great. The ColecoVision RGB actually looks better through it than the 5X although it still suffers from the low audio issue although not as low which is weird. There's about a three decibel difference between the Tink 2X SCART on the ColecoVision and the 5X. So there's definitely some differences there. Although Mike Chi has stated that the 2X and the 5X SCART sections are basically identical. So I don't know what that's about. Let's get this 4013 out of here. It's unfortunate why Atari soldered the, the stupid chip directly to the board on the two port units or most two port units. On almost every four port unit, it's actually socketed. Whoa! Just had a glop of solder fall out of my gun. It's not good. Well, the pins are pretty moving, so similar to the power switch, it's just stuck to the board. So I will very carefully try to get under it. There we go. Just apply a little bit of leverage on the sides just to kind of put it up and out of there. There we go. All right, <clears throat> clean that area up a little bit. And yes, for those that are curious, I will be installing a socket. Let's see. 14 pin, okay. Do I have any 14 pin sockets? I believe I do. Not on that. Uh, let's see. Even if I don't have any sockets, let's see. Um, what I do have is I've got, they're very expensive. I don't like to use them, but I have them. Yeah, these are all my, this is my sockets package here. Let's see, these should be 14 here, right? Yeah, yeah, as I suspected, I got, I got quite a few of these on hand. See, so yeah, it's just a piece of styrofoam that I just jam all my spare sockets into, different sizes. Let's get us a new 14 pin socket right there. Okay. Get that popped into place. No. 
obviously if this doesn't correct anything, then we are dealing with some sort of um, IC failure at that point, which is not fun. Not fun at all. Okay, make sure that's in all the way. Go. Okay. Back to the opposite corner. I don't want to hold it and burn myself in the process. Okay. Should be golden. You might be wondering, why am I not adding any flux to this separately? Oh, what do we got here? Installing sockets and boards may be the most satisfying thing ever in repair work. I truly hate how Coleco didn't socket the VDP or the CPU or any of the VRAM. The VRAM is my main issue with ColecoVision. Uh, by far, that is probably my least favorite repair, is when I have to replace any of the VRAM modules. Even with my, uh, even with my 300, with my FR300, um, I will still tendency, I will still sometimes lift a pad. That's the other problem, too, is, I mean, Coleco used heavily leaded solder, um, and it should melt easier than it does, but it just doesn't. And so one of the other problems that I have is that even with the iron at a fairly low temperature, I will have the pads just simply vaporize when either desoldering or soldering in a component. It's, it's ridiculous. I'm actually a strong proponent of when replacing the VDP chips on the Coleco, I actually prefer to just cut the old chips off, then use my soldering iron and tweezers to manually remove the legs at that point. And then solder in the sockets after clean up. That's what I do. So okay. That, First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to plug this back in without the chip to make sure it doesn't self-power. It shouldn't, but just to make sure. That's the old chip right there. Here's my new one. I haven't taken, or my replacement, I haven't taken it off of here yet. See, the original is a, oh, I should know that brand. I can't remember. I'd have to research it. The replacement's a Motorola, so it should be good. Let's see here. I still have power. That is crazy. So, somehow the flip bit is enabled somewhere else in the system. Well, let's go ahead and put the replacement 4013 in, just in case. Okay. That's in. It is still self-powered. It is still powered on. Wow. Okay. So one of the IC chips is at fault. And because of the goofiness that was occurring, I'm actually going to start with the antic. I'm just going to remove it completely off the board here. I'm not sure if I have any replacements. I might. I should. I've got spare 5200 boards that are parts donors that were sent in from other techs that don't really work on 5200s. So. Just work it out slowly so I don't risk damaging any of the legs. Or anything else on the chip? There we go. Oh, 
Nothing obvious, but of course it wouldn't be necessarily. All right, I shouldn't get any power on here. It does. Wow. What is shorting to cause it to stay powered on? Could it be the GTIA? Well, one way to really know. This is very strange. I can honestly say I don't think I've ever had a 5200 that's exhibited these behaviors before. It was working initially when powered up, and then it just started acting goofy with some graphic corruption after it had been on for a while, indicating when it's warmed up. And there's only two chips that produce graphics. And that is the GTIA and the Antic. And this is the GTIA that I have just removed. Does it still power itself on? It does. That is strange. Hmm. Could it be a bad CPU? Well, wouldn't be the first time I've had Sally go bad. Signetics. That's unfortunate. The Rockwell and Signetics <clears throat> 6502 Sally's tend to have some intermittent issues with them. It's actually preferred. I think the NCRs are probably the best ones to have. I don't know if it's as much of an issue with the 5200, but it definitely is not fun on the 78. Uh, in fact, it's recently been found that the Concerto and the Dragonfly cartridges uh, exhibit some problematic issues when used with, especially with Rockwell CPUs. So this chip is in here. It is in there. I mean, it's supposed to be, but I do have a chip puller, but I'll be honest, I've ended up bending legs using it more often than just carefully working them out like this. Even these legs on the end still get a little bent up here. What would cause this thing to power itself on? Just makes no sense. Still, I have voltage. Wow. That is very odd. Why would it power itself on? Something somewhere isn't triggering it. What have we got? I do the exact same thing when removing dead or unneeded ICs. Just chop them out, mostly on the VRAM upgrade, since no one will miss the old ones. Oh, well, yeah. And the old ones are, you know, when you do the upgrade anyway, you're removing the negative 5 volt line off of the memory circuit anyway. So you can't use the old memory after that. Uh, and you certainly can't mix a match. Um, I do actually have a pretty cool new diagnostic test. I showed this off in a video. CV Diagnostics Kit. And um, it's basically a self-contained testing suite <clears throat> that plugs off of the expansion port on the ColecoVision. in combination with a PCB that goes into the cartridge slot, and I marked on it so I would know which is which, and 
because the fingers are a little too high, <laughs> uh, at least on this, uh, at least on this initial release of these boards, uh, the metal plate will actually touch these. That's why I've got my Kapton tape wrapped around it. Um, anyway, so this is a really handy diagnostic tool because what it can do is literally, um, I can basically plug it into a dead ColecoVision that's not giving me anything on the screen. Plug this in and it actually interfaces with a terminal program. In this case, I can actually, um, I can actually uh, pair it up with my tablet. And uh, yeah, it's it's very handy. It's also got uh, it will produce like a basic graphics test, so you can at least verify that the graphic circuitry is working um, on the VDP uh, without even the you know main logic really working because it just injects it directly through the expansion slot. Because as I'm sure you're aware, <clears throat> the expansion port on the front of the Coleco has uh, audio and input lines on it. Or, yeah, audio video input lines on. But uh, anyway, so what is the deal with this thing? 4013 didn't take care of it. Plugging in a cartridge isn't going to do any good. I don't think. That is strange. Hmm. What would cause a 5200 to self power on? Even with the switch removed, it still did it. Even with the switch removed. So that leads me to believe we could be dealing with an issue with one of these transistors. I don't know if it's Q8 or Q10 that I need to look at. Where it is anyway? Let's see it. It's 3904. Your standard MPN, low power switching transistor. It's this one. Also a 3904. What is Q9? Let me guess. Another 3904? Yes. So all of those are 3904s. I don't think the issue is the 201s. I don't think. Those usually just fail flat out and don't do anything. I've got some 3904s, but I need some caps in the I don't like that. Is that tracer here? Oh, crap. That's a repaired trace. There. What that was done at the factory. Well, on the top side of the board. Let's clean that up and see what's up. <laughs> yep, that's a trace repair. There's a lead soldered down. Question is, did Atari do that or somebody else that was inside of this? I remember seeing that guy in your video. It reminds me of Luke. Where'd you get it anyhow? It would be super handy. Oh, you mean my actual meter? Uh, this isn't one you're going to commonly find in the States. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, this is my 17B+. It's actually a pretty basic meter. 
It's not uh, it's not a true RMS or anything like that. So unlike most flukes you buy here in the states, it doesn't have a um, uh, it doesn't have a a meter along the bottom. It does have a nice big display though, nice and easy to read. Um, I actually bought it out of China. <laughs> yeah, this model flukes not available here. But uh, anyway, but I wanted to get this particular model. Um, it can do some capacitance, although eh, its accuracy is dubious. I've not been able to get the frequency stuff working, really. Um, it could just be me using it wrong, more than likely. Uh, but it can do milliamps, which is nice, and even microamps, which is also nice. Um, but more importantly, uh, and just because I've used it a couple of times, it can also do temperature, and it did come with a temperature probe when I bought it. Um, these are not the original leads. It came with a set of leads that honestly were much cheaper looking and feeling. These are actually some leads from an actual old Series 77 fluke that I've been using uh, that I have at my office. Yeah, I've got a, an old Series 77, like a Series 2, I think, 77 at the office. But it doesn't have as many features as this. This also has a backlit uh, display, which can't really be seen because of where I've got it in the video. But uh, it's going to be hard to tell that it's even lit up or not. <laughs> so, yeah, it's that's what it is. It's 17B plus, and I got it uh, overseas. I actually think I ordered it through Amazon. So what it is is it's a it's a model fluke that is obviously built to a price. Um, specifically for international markets. They don't sell them here in the States. So it wasn't very expensive. I think I paid uh, just a little over $120 shipped for, for this particular meter. Oh, no, I meant the guy that plugs into the CD expansion slot. Oh. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, yes, I misunderstood. Yes, where did I get that? So uh, it actually came from a guy at Atari Age. His name is Child of CB. So, child of ColecoVision. Uh, he's very versed in the ColecoVision uh, schematics. In fact, I think he was even in the process of redoing the ColecoVision schematics. I don't know if he ever finished that project or not. Anyway, he developed this. And um, I don't know how many of them he made. He wasn't planning on, like, selling them wide stream. I think he shared the, the files and everything for it. So... It is certainly possible to um, to probably order up a PCB, populate it, program it, do whatever you need to do. I honestly don't have a way to program uh, FPGAs or anything like that. So if, if they don't offer it already constructed and done, I'm kind of uh, at a loss. There's just not been too many opportunities where I needed to do that. But yes, that's where I got the board. So uh, and it's been very handy. Uh, like I said, it's it's been incredibly handy. So let's see, what else could we do here? This is just bizarre. Why would it? Self power on. There's some additional corrosion here, but that's at the RF modulator. Still. And it's not like rust, it's that white flaky stuff, like what happens when water is dried. And given that I do see actual rust rust along the RF shielding, I can say that this has probably um, gotten wet at some point in its life. Anyway, the cool thing about that ColecoVision tester is that when I plug it in and you go through its different suite of tests, uh, the video RAM test can actually pinpoint to the actual chip that it read last. So it can give you an idea as to what chip is reading faulty. So if you don't feel like just clipping them all out and replacing the whole thing out with the 5-volt upgrade kit, 
then you can certainly um, just try replacing the one that could be bad. Well, those aren't shorted. What on earth would cause this thing to power itself on? So not only did this thing arrive busted in shipping, but it's got <clears throat> logic error as well of some sort. So normally at this point, I would need to switch over to my skims and my 5200 um, service manual. Problem is, I'm using <laughs> one machine I usually use to pull that up with for streaming. So let's pull out, let's get this board out of the way for a second. Let me just set this down. Out of the way, let me get my tablet pulled up. So I can do some research. This will be a boring part, I'm afraid, because I'm going to need to do some research and take a look at some things. Find out what is going on. Turn off my iron, but I'm not using it right now. And turn off the desoldering iron as well. This is the tablet I actually used to connect up to the ColecoVision kit. Um, as soon as I plugged the uh, cable, the USB, the micro USB from the tablet to the ColecoVision and power on the ColecoVision, it instantly takes me to the uh, terminal software so that I installed, which is very cool, very handy. Unfortunately, this tablet takes a long time to boot up. And because it's been so long since I've powered it up, it's probably got about a thousand notifications it's going to give me. Okay, now I got a screen. All right, let's uh, connect up to my cloud. Okay, not all the icons have loaded yet. That's because some of my applications are actually on the SD card, so I'm still reading from it. Here's my cloud. <clears throat> okay. Currently having trouble attaching to the cloud. Probably because I don't think the Wi Fi is up yet. Yeah, I just attached to Wi Fi. There we go. So let's see if I can attach now. There we go. <clears throat> yeah, I keep all my documents on a cloud NAS that I host here on my local network. Makes it convenient. I can pull up the documents from my phone if I need to look at something really quick or reference something. Uh, obviously, I can do it through my tablet. Um, I can do it through, well, any computer, really. All right, so let's open up the 5200 folders and let's go through the service manual. <clears throat> All right, here we are. Shrink that down a little bit. It's a little too much. Uh, two, 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 two poor models. There we go. Flow chart starts at 4A-1. Okay, so let's scroll through. Skims. which I will probably need to reference those as well at some point. But for now, let's get to the flow chart. Flow charts will at least hopefully keep me from chasing my tail too much. Okay, let's 
for diagnostic codes. We're not even getting that far. Two port. Tell me I need my scope. If I need to, I'll break out the scope. Uh, I don't have the diagnostic cartridge yet. At least not a dedicated one. I really need to get me one. I got the loopback board. Got this manual. Okay. Oh. So I really need the flow chart. Solid colored black vertical line screen appears. The unit is suffering a catastrophic failure. No kidding. It's not functioning well enough to even return a simple display. Yes, I know. So we've got to hit the flow chart. Okay. Here we are. Oh, here come all my notifications. All right, let's see. What's this one here? Is there five volts on the output of VR1? Okay, so let's start. All right, so easiest way to do this is I'm going to need to set this off to the side, which means I'm going to be blocking the chat window. Can't do anything about that. <clears throat> All right, we'll go ahead and plug Pete's test cartridge in. And we'll get it plugged in. I need to get it set so I can check some voltages. All right, of course it powered itself on still. Very annoying. All right. Let's go down here and... Um, I'm not getting any voltage off of that one. We are getting voltage here, but I got a dead. I got at least one dead voltage regulator. For sure. Let's make sure it's not an issue with ground. It shouldn't be. Yeah, that's that's dead. I got a dead VR. <clears throat> Still doesn't explain why it powers itself on, but either way, I got a dead voltage regulator. Okay. So we need to change out this one right here, which is actually VR1. Hey, that's the very first one it told me to check. All right. Now, it is telling me that if I'm not getting my 5 volts, to go to B1, page 4-4. So just to make sure, it's probably going to tell me to, oh, is there approximately 11 to 13 on the input of VR1? Let's say yes, because I was getting 12 volts um, on the other side. So this tells me it's a defective VR or there's an output short to the ground, which is a possible chip issue. Um, so it's either a defective, oh, interesting. So this is, so we either have a problem with the voltage regulator or there's an output short to ground with a possible chip issue, in which case it's telling me that I could also potentially have, well, then it just tells me to repair it. So that's the first thing we'll do is we'll try changing out this VR, this voltage regulator, and see what that gives us. Okay, get my tablet out of the way for a second. What does the blue pot on the UAV do? Oh. Oh, you know what? I've got a dead UAV. That's easier to use. Yeah, I actually have, I've, I've got one faulty UAV. I've actually had three in the four plus years I've been installing these now. I've had three that have had problems out of the box. This one is one that I have not been able to fix. Um, so you're talking about this right here, this this uh, this trimmer. So what is its purpose? Technically, uh, it depends on what you're using it on. If we're talking about a 2600 or a 7800, it really doesn't do much at all. Okay. It's mainly designed to adjust the artifact phasing on the Atari 8-bit and 5200 consoles. 
Having said that, I don't think I've really ever noticed much of a difference in the artifacting effects when using it with the 5200. And I'm trying to think of any games on the 5200 that actually use artifacting that were officially released. I know there's some prototypes like Miniature Golf for the 5200 that um, used it, but I don't know of any actual commercial released games that used artifacting. But that's what it's for. It's for adjusting the phasing of the artifact effect, which of course is only going to work if you're using the composite output. So basically you would attach from the composite side from this pin here and ground, and then uh, with a sample test screen up and running, for instance, you just adjust the trimmer left and right until the artifact, in this case whatever color is being shown uh, through the artifact test looks how you want it to look. There is an official program, there is an XEX file for the UAV testing of the artifact adjustment for the Atari 8 bits. Supposedly that test will also work in the 5200, but I have not seen um, I have not seen the actual bin file, the binary for the 5200 to test it with. So I honestly just kind of leave it centered, which is the default. Um, on the 7800, here's the thing. If you try to use it on the 7800 or the 2600, you will notice a very, very, very slight shift in the way the shadow effect might work or the color bleed might work on some of the blues. Um, however, That is actually pretty much a non-issue if you pair it up. This is specifically a 7800 I'm talking about here. Hold on, i got a brand new UAV here. I keep several on hand because I install a lot of UAV boards. <clears throat> you need to pair it up with one of those. Um, that is specifically a very simple circuit board that I designed. I didn't design the circuit. Somebody else designed the circuit. I just designed the PCB and had them made up. It uses a 4050 buffer, which the 7800 does not use. But strangely, a lot of 2600s and the 5200 do. Here's the 4050 on the 5200, for instance. Um, and what we're doing with it in this particular case on the 7800 and it's actually pretty cool. The, the, I actually designed the board not purposely, but it works. Because we're not using the outer vias on the UAV when you install it on a 7800, because you only install you only solder your wiring to the inside pins or the inside vias here, the smaller ones. These outer ones were actually designed for um, either installing a socket and putting a 4050 into it, in the case of the 5200 installs, or uh, also the interconnect pins or headers connect to it for, again, for 5200 installations like that. But because it's not used, those vias are not used on an actual 7800, and because we are using a 4050 for this fix, you can actually just put a couple of leads through the five volt and ground that I have on the pad, and they'll match up with the five volt and the ground on the UAV. So once you've got all your other wiring in place and soldered in and ran out, or in some cases, I'll actually solder it from the bottom side, uh, then I can just take this and essentially solder it up above like that. And then I have a separate Maria color input and output off the board. So instead of just running the Maria color in directly to the coal in here on the UAV, you actually uh, attach it to this input here. And then it ends up going through three of the four gates on this 4050, which causes just enough of a delay in the signal from the output to correct most of the color bleeding that occurs on the UAV through a 7800. So uh, it's called the chroma fix, the chroma timing fix. And this is one of the this is a one of the first version boards. I've actually got a whole new set of these on the way. They still look basically the same. Uh, I made it a tiny bit smaller around the edges um, just to kind of shrink it up. And I moved the um, I moved the input and output pads down towards this area here just to make it a little easier. When it gets installed, you just run your input line to here and the output line can just go straight across here, real short distance run. 
Um, and they're white. Yeah, my replacement boards are going to be white so that they blend in with the UAV a little bit better than, than just sticking this green thing on top. But anyway, that's that's what I did. What do you think of Tim's Atari 2600 RGB kit? Is it really the big of a jump from the cheaper and a simpler UAVS video, for example? Okay, well, um, let's talk about Tim's RGB kit. I've installed it twice. Um, I will tell you this about the RGB kit. If you use the S video, uh, I'm just going to put it this way. Tim's RGB kit produces the best S video output on a 2600 I have ever seen. It's that simple. It is the best looking S video maybe I have ever seen um, from anything. But it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's difficult to install it really. It's just a lot of soldering. It's more difficult to install it on the light and heavy sixers. And that's because of the different uh, interposer boards that you have to solder together and you have to do things in a very specific way. If you miss a step in there somewhere, you're going to find yourself not being able to solder something in uh, the way you need to when all the different boards have to sandwich on top of each other. So, yeah. Um, anyway, while I'm talking, I should be sitting here replacing this voltage regulator. So, um, it produces an excellent S-video output. That's what I can tell you about Tim's board. But... Um, I have concerns with other parts of it because I'm not the first person to experience this. I experienced it myself, and I know of at least several other people. Um, Ruggers actually installed one and asked me about some problems he was having with it because it seemed to have difficulty. The board, the RGB board, was having issues being able to detect PAL versus NTSC. If you didn't know about Tim's RGB board, it actually can auto-detect based on the input signal from the cartridge or however it's been programmed. Um, but it can get confused, and that's obviously not good. Hold on a second. I want to clean the gunk, the old um, thermal paste off of this VR. Now, I'm going to desolder it anyway, but I need to get it off of there and not have it get all over the place. In fact, since I'm thinking about it. Okay, so <clears throat> the S-Video is really good. The composite signal from it was equal to anything else, honestly. So it doesn't really do anything there. The RGB output was excellent. It had really good RGB output. But I also wired up the component, and I saw no difference through my audio-video equipment between the component and the RGB. So if you don't have the means to use the RGB SCART setup, from the uh, from the RGB board, then just wire it up with component. But you're going to have to purchase a separate little uh, daughter board that solders on that provides you and transcodes the RGB out to the required uh, uh, component YUV levels. But that looked really good. Um, but I have concerns with something else. Um, and Tim has told me personally that this just happens sometimes, and he hasn't figured out why. And anytime the creator of his own device tells me something like that, it makes me a little nervous. So the first RGB board I had in worked great. It was working great for several days while testing it, and um, at least through RGB and component. And then I went ahead and wired in the composite in the S-Video, and that seemed to work just fine, no problem. When I put it all back together and connected up the component, RGB, S-Video, and the composite all at the same time to test them one at a time, and turn the system on, uh, it wasn't pretty. I don't know what happened, but something shorted out on the RGB board with all of that stuff connected at once. I have to assume it overdrove. I think the RGB board just got overdriven with too many inputs or too many outputs that it was trying to drive at once. And it burned something up. And it burned up in the same way that other people have complained. Basically, once the RGB board dies, you no longer get any LED activity lights. And when you test, for shorts between 5 volt and ground on the RGB board, it's shorted everywhere. So something on one of the chips gets fried inside and shorts 5 volt to ground on the RGB board. Luckily, it doesn't damage the Atari. Um, you can usually just pop the RGB board out, plug the TIA chip back into the original socket, and the, the Atari fires up just fine. 
But the very first RGB board I had lasted for about three or four days during testing. And then when I plugged everything in at once to test it to make sure everything was good to go, uh, it burned up on me and I had to order a replacement. Yeah. So be warned. Don't uh, really only use one output at a time from the uh, RGB board, from Tim's RGB board, at least on the 2600. I don't know if, if that's an issue on his Nintendo RGB board, but I know that they are largely uh, similar in design. They even look very similar. But other than that, it provided excellent S-Video. It was uh, superior to the S-Video from the UAV, at least on the 2600. And of course, the component in the RGB was excellent. Do I think it's a worthy upgrade? Um, that's a different story because the RGB board is not cheap compared to the UAV. And if you're not going to use component or RGB specifically, then I really don't see a need to jump to it for just its S-Video over the S-Video you get from the UAV because the UAV still provides very good excellent S video. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's my take on it. I actually have a spare uh, RGB board from Tim. I haven't installed it in anything yet. I have one here. Don't know that I will necessarily, but um, actually I just turned my iron on. It's not ready yet. Oh, and I was saying earlier, the reason why I'm not using additional flux, this uh, solder that I'm using already has uh, flux rosin core in it, but it's no clean flux, which is um, different than I'm used to. I haven't actually used this solder very long, and I'll be honest, there's some parts of it I don't like. The solder tends to actually get gummy up and sticky more than the other stuff I had that was not the no clean. But more importantly, I have found that when I try to use this solder with my standard liquid solder flux here, it um, it just behaves badly. <laughs> it just does not work very well. I will still use it in some instances, but I don't use it very often with this solder. And since I've got this giant pound spool of this stuff, I'm going to be uh, using it for a while. Again, what I'm doing here is I'm replacing out voltage regulator one because I am not getting a five volt output from it at all with a cartridge plugged in, and I should be. Now there could be still something else wrong with the console causing this. I don't know yet, but I can say at least for a fact that it's uh, doesn't appear to be reading here currently. Let's see, yep, I've got another Q-tip sitting here. Still need to clean the uh, <clears throat> the old thermal paste off of the heat sink. Yeah. Thanks for the input, yeah, no problem. I, I don't know that I can say I'm an expert with the RGB board from Tim because again, I've really only installed it twice. Um, But it, I mean, it when it works, it looked great, but it can be tricky to install. And I do recommend if you're going to use one or if you do plan to install one, you definitely need to install the secondary function button that you have to attach to the Atari somewhere. Um, not only does that provide you with a pause by uh, creating a halt on the CPU, but it's also the only way that you can change some of the functions and options on the RGB board is with that secondary button. And um, so I, I heavily recommend it. Now, do I recommend installing the additional wiring to player one's controller ports and then modifying a joystick for those remote functions? Maybe. Um, but the only thing you can really do with that is it does give you the ability to do remote resets and uh, select. And of course you can change palettes. But it could be argued that, you know, it could be argued that it's just as easy to just kind of get up and just hit the reset or select switch to whichever game mode you want and go from there. So I wouldn't say that the remote controlling capability on the joystick is as desirable as that secondary function button is. So I would definitely 
consider installing that. I'm just trying to get some old masking tape off of here. Not sure where this came from, why it's there, it doesn't need to be there, but it's there. Try to get as much of that off of there as I can. It may not all come off of there, but we'll try. It's sticky glue residue. All right, I'll be right back. I gotta get me some uh, uh, tissue paper to clean off this uh, voltage regulator and stuff. Okay. Good old tissue paper. Works good for this stuff. First thing I'm going to do is get the gunk off the screw. The old stuff, or at least as much of it off of there as I can. There we go. It's nice and shiny looking again. Then I'm going to wipe the old stuff off the old one. Yes, I know the old one doesn't work. Why even bother? Well, all the components that I replace and change out for my clients, I put into a little anti-static bag and I send it back with the console. Um, that's for two reasons. I have some clients that like to keep the stuff because it's part of the original history of the system, so they, they keep it. I don't know why. Um, and so they can see firsthand what was replaced, what's been fixed. They can see all the stuff I took off, removed, whatever. Whatever was needed. I mean, I don't think there's any reason why any of my clients would not believe me when I say I've done something, but I do it anyway, no big deal. We kind of do the same thing with my own customers at my work. So, okay. <clears throat> now, although I have, will be replacing out this voltage regulator, it's just a standard 7805, which I have quite a few of on hand. Um, if the other one's working, uh, and it seems to be, because I was getting a 5-volt read off of it, I'm still probably going to um, clean it up and apply some new thermal paste anyway, just to be on the safe side. Let's see, I need to start a bag for parts. And I may put his 4013 back in after this. Although I don't regret installing the socket because that could still be something that has to be replaced out in the future. Never know. Get in there. So those pins are pretty shiny. It, uh, it desoldered and came out pretty clean. That's good. <clears throat> okay. Now, let's get the new regulator installed. So here's something I don't think I've ever mentioned. A lot of these regulators screw onto the boards or screw onto a heat sink. 
And of course, the leads on them are much longer than they need to be. So the way that I measure that out is I will, of course, <clears throat> insert the regulator where it needs to. And then I will actually go ahead and screw it down to the heat sink. Where it needs to go. That way, I know exactly how long the bleeds need to be. I'll go ahead and solder it in place like this, then I'll clip them. And then I'll form it back down out of the way and uh, apply the thermal compound. Come on, there you go. Luckily, 7805s are not expensive at all. It's a cheap repair item, the dollar part. Okay. Now I will take it back off. Carefully reform it down and out of the way. Get my thermal paste ready to go here. on there. And when I reattach it, <clears throat> it will smooth itself out where it needs to. Oh, just like that. Okay, so real quick, let's see if that makes any difference. Get the solder out of the way here. Don't want it to short on anything. I've got a feeling it's still going to power itself on. And it did. Still does not turn off. Uh, let's get a cartridge plugged in. Already used up on my old. Okay. See if I'm at least getting voltages out when I plug this back in. <clears throat> Still powers itself on. It's not good. All right. DC. Touch that to there. No. Still no voltage. That's very strange. We're reading 12.2 volts on the input rail, so we definitely have voltage. Got 12 volts at the diode. Got 
12 volts on the output of the diode. But there's no input voltage to the voltage regulator. Okay. Got some uh, thermal paste on me there. Get that wiped off. Okay. So, no input voltage. Let's see if I can trace where all these inputs go. See it there, see it there. following the traces as best I can. Okay, that's the output. There's the input side there. So something else has failed in the logic. Take a look at another 5200 board. This is why I always keep spare parts boards on hand. This is an earlier two-port board that still had some factory bodges on it. But I believe what I need to check is all still the same. Yes, the input rail or the input is still the same. So, uh, da -da 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 -da, those are my 7805s. Something to kind of trace along with. Okay, so... This is the input rail for that voltage regulator, right here. So, <clears throat> where does that come off of? Okay, jumps along over to here. That comes off of this MJT, this two oh one right here. 
maybe I do have a faulting MJ chip. Let's see if I'm reading anything. Because that's what should be supplying my output voltage. Dang it, stay still. And there's no voltage here. And it should be coming from here. Nothing. There's 12 volts there. 12 volts there. 12 volts. 12 volts. volts. Nothing. I'll be darned. That's our problem, child, right there. More than likely. Because I'm definitely getting input voltage to it. The emitter and the base are putting out their 12 volts, but the collector side is not putting anything out. Um, let's see, where is that bed? It's not. So there's nothing else that connects to. That straight up just puts out what we need. Okay, so may not have been anything wrong with the voltage regulator. The problem could very well have been this jerk right here. It's 201 right here. So I'm going to go ahead and remove it. And I don't have any replacements, but I've got plenty on spare boards. Definitely gets hot. Uh, get something here that I don't burn myself with. Okay. There's that. I might put this voltage regulator back in, just but first we got to get it to a functioning state. That's the primary thing. Okay, so what do you think I'm going to do? Yep, I'm going to remove the MJE. 201 off of this board, this other two port unit, although any Atari would work. I don't remember what the issues are with this one, but obviously it's got a lot. It's missing all of its main chips. go. Let's pop this one in its place and see if anything improves. <clears throat> I 
Now to initially tack that in, I'm just going to apply some solder from the top of it. There we go. Those leads barely stick out through the other side, but they're there. Okay. That's in. Let's see if anything changes. Yes, this is a slow process, but it's best to replace one component at a time in order to know what actually caused the problem. You don't want to just shotgun a whole bunch of stuff and then it works and then you don't know exactly where the issue was. Things we know it's not is it doesn't appear to be the 4013. It's probably not the voltage regulator because the replacement wasn't getting any input voltage either. So, <clears throat> yeah. All right, let's see. Okay, it still powered itself on, which I don't like. All right, let's attach this. Still nothing. Okay, I definitely got 12 volts there. Reading 12 volts there. There's no output voltage at all. Wow. Oh. No input voltage at all. None. Okay. <clears throat> huh. So, not the 201. Where else could the problem lie? Well, that's just pretty much the input. That's just the input straight from the DC jack. So the only other thing is to start tracing from the other side. First immediate component is this resistor, which I'm pretty sure was reading 12 volts. Comes out through the other side there, comes along here, along here. That just ends up going to One of those filter caps. Interesting. Oh, okay. Let's let's see what's next on the agenda. Okay. Okay, so I'm not getting input voltage. So is there zero volts on point two of the schematic? Well, <clears throat> I gotta go to the schematic. And in this case, specifically the two port schematic. Okay. 
Point two on the schematic. Oh boy. All right, so point two is by R57. Is a 330 watt or 331 watt resistor. Is that going to be? This is R59 or 56. Fifty-two R fifty-seven. Where are you hiding? It's probably under something that I cannot see. Okay. Yeah, it's going to be, I almost need an unpopulated 5200 volt guy. I believe that is R57 right there. Okay, so R57 wants to know if there's zero, zero volts. All right. So let me go back to the troubleshooting list. So R57 is one of the big giant resistors. And I should have known that just from the fact that it said it was a one watt dissipating resistor. Because those are big. <laughs> so it's one of the two big ones right by the uh, voltage regulator. Or the, uh, not the voltage regulator, sorry, the RF modulator. Okay, so is there approximately zero volts? on the schematic. Yes, I know. One thing about this meter I don't like is it is basically auto, it has a timer on it. Doesn't matter if I've been using it or not, it will automatically shut itself off after so much time. Even if I were to pick up the probes and start checking things out, yeah, it'll still shut itself off. It's very annoying. Okay, so let's get this board back out again. We want to check and see if there's zero volts. I don't think we have zero volts. I don't think we do at all. Because it powers itself up. Touch the ground. We're reading 12 volts there. And 12 volts there. So we're reading 12 volts on both ends. Okay. Since it doesn't turn off, I'll have to disconnect. No, I do not read zero volts. Then there is a defective J1 or an open between 0.1 of voltage regulator two and 0.2 of voltage regulator one with a cartridge in. Defective J1. J1 is the cartridge slot. Really? You're telling me there's a short in the cartridge slot? That would be a new one. 
but there's only one way to know, right? <clears throat> and that is to remove it. That is a lot of work, but it may be the only thing I can do to verify what's going on. It does kind of explain Well, moving the cartridge slot around didn't really make a difference. But I cleaned it and it didn't do anything. If I remove the cartridge slot and I still have these readings the way they are, I'm assuming there's something else on the board further down. That wouldn't make sense. There's not a whole lot here between the power on condition. Smoke off that solder it is hot. I can feel it on my hand.
cartridge port's been removed. Okay. Does it still power itself on? It sure does. Seriously got it shorted to anything here. That all checks out. So it's not the cartridge port, although I didn't really think it was.
I'll tell you what, I think I'm going to kill the stream for now. It's obvious I got a lot of troubleshooting to do with this 5200 to try to figure out what's going on with it. So if I get it figured out here pretty quickly, I may start the stream back up. But in the meantime, thanks for hanging out and uh, catch you guys another time.